Hello, this is a, an A-level video on nuclear medicine which discusses how we can use radioactive isotopes to diagnose and image patients and their body systems. So let's get started straight away. So what we've looked at so far is x-rays and we've talked about how x-rays can be used to make quite detailed images of body systems. X-rays are an external technology, so we direct the X-rays from one side of the patient through to the other side, and we detect them on the other side of the patient using a camera or a film. What nuclear medicine does is it places our diagnostic technology within the body, um, and we can place it within the body, and then it will emit its radiation, and we can detect that radiation outside the body. And this has certain distinct advantages to X-rays. Okay, so what sort of radioactive isotope do we want to use? Well, it has to be firstly a gamma emitter, okay? It, it's got to be a gamma emitter because alpha and beta are not penetrating enough to escape the body. So if you placed an alpha emitter within the body, A, it would be dangerous because it's highly ionizing, and B, it's not very penetrating, and so the radiation wouldn't escape from the body. And similar things can be said about beta. Okay, so we have to use a gamma emitter. The gamma emitter that we do use must have a reasonably short half-life, not too short, but reasonably short. So what we want is to make a, re a reasonably rapid diagnosis, um, but we don't want the isotope to remain in our body for too long. We want it to have a short half-life so that it will decay quickly and the damage to the patient's body will be minimized. So in essence, we need a, sh a gamma emitter with a half-life of a of generally speaking a few hours. Now one of the most widely used, in fact the most widely used um, radioisotope in nuclear medicine is called technetium 99M. Now 99 is the mass number of the isotope, technetium is the element and M stands for metastable which we'll have a look at in a minute. So this is produced via a beta decay in molybdenum-99. So the parent isotope for technetium-99M is molybdenum-99, and that decays via the emission of a beta particle and an antineutrino, standard beta decay, to technetium-99M. Now, the molybdenum-99 has a half-life of 67 hours. So technetium 99M is what we call a metastable state, which we'll have a look at in a minute, and it decays to ordinary technetium 99 via gamma emission. And this is the one we want to have going on in, in the patient's body. Now this has a half-life of six hours, so it's quite suitable for medical diagnosis because it's short enough for the doctor to make a diagnosis and for the isotope to get around the body, <clears throat> but it's not too long. So by the time damage starts being done to the patient, the isotope will have decayed away. So six hours is a good half-life for that. Um, so the technetium is excreted by the body, and then that decays by beta emission to another isotope, which has a very long half-life. But by the time this happens, um, the technetium has left the body. So here's a little decay graph for that. We've got the molybdenum at the top, and this decays via beta decay with a half-life of, well, it says 66, 67 hours there, to technetium 99M, the metastable form of technetium, and that decays via gamma emission with a half-life of a roughly six hours to technetium 99, and that's the one that happens in the body. This uh, decay is what we want to happen in the patient's body. Okay, so what we're going to do is inject this stuff and let it decay. All right, so we've talked about this term metastable, so we ought to kind of describe what that means a little bit. Now, there are some, um, some isotopes that have two states. Uh, both of them are stable, so it, uh, uh, but the metastable state is what we call an excited state. So the, the nucleus of technetium 99M is in an excited state. And normal excited nuclei will immediately drop down into a, a lower energy state. For example, <clears throat> some 
elements that decay via alpha decay will immediately be followed by a gamma decay as the nucleus drops from a higher energy excited state into a lower state. Now a metastable state can stay in that excited state for far longer than usual, up to a few hours in this case. So an analogy of it is, is this little ball. So the most stable state for this little black ball is down here, but there's also another less stable but still stable state up here and this is the metastable state. Now a slight nudge for, on, on this ball will knock it out of that metastable state and, and it will fall into this more stable lower energy state. So this is kind of like a gravitational analogy to what's happening in the nucleus, very simple one. Okay so the metastable state is one where the nucleus will stay in its excited state because it's reasonably stable for longer than a normal uh, nucleus would, okay, um, and then it will drop down into its lower energy state via the emission of a gamma photon, and obviously um, the energy of the gamma photon will equal the difference in the energy levels of the nucleus, uh, and the energy of these gamma rays in technetium-99 are approximately 140 keV, which is a similar sort of energy to um, some of the x-rays that we use for alternative diagnosis. Okay, so that's what we mean by metastable. So the next part of this is to look at how we actually produce technetium 99M. Um, now this has to be done in the hospital itself because of the short half-life, it can't be transported. So the technetium 99M must be manufactured on site. So what the hospital will do is it will buy on a weekly basis, it will buy a supply of molybdenum-99. Um, now, molybdenum-99 is produced in nuclear fission research reactors, um, of which there are a few up and down the country and around the world. And molybdenum-99 is a byproduct of nuclear fission. So this research reactor will, will supply many hospitals, probably all the hospitals in the country, um, with a weekly supply of molybdenum-99, which is shipped down in what they call cows, or technetium generators is, is the actual technical term of it. Um, it's a lead-shielded box full of molybdenum-99 in essence. So this has a half-life of 67 hours. So the hospital will get their supply of molybdenum-99 on site, and then they will manufacture the technetium-99M from the molybdenum. Okay, and you need to know how this is done. Okay, well I've got a diagram coming up in a minute, but let's just have a look at this, this text just, just to see what, what's happening. So the, the molybdenum-99 is what we call adsorbed onto alumina. So basically they get a column of alumina, okay, which is like a, a compound of uh, aluminium oxide, and the molybdenum-99 is effectively bonded to this... Um, this compound. It, the, the, the alumina forms a substrate onto which the molybdenum-99 is bonded and that process is called adsorption. Now when it does that it forms a compound called molybdate which is MOO4-2- so it's a doubly um, negative ion. So the molybdenum-99 in the form of this compound sits there decaying and as it decays it, the compound here changes into what we call pertechnotate. Now pertechnotate has the formula TCO41- sing, a singly negative ion which contains the radioactive technetium. Now the thing is that this, this pertechnotate is only singly ionized all right, whereas the molybdate is doubly ionized and as such it forms a less strong bond, a, a looser bond if you like, with the, alum, with the alumina. So it's still bonded to the alumina but less strongly because of the singly ionized molecule. Um, so what you do then is, is you, you, you pull saline solution across the alumina and the protechnicate, protechnitate will dissolve in the saline solution. Okay, so you will then get um, a solution of pertechnotate, all right, in what we call sodium pertechnotate. So it bonds with the sodium in the saline solution, forming sodium pertechnotate. 
and that can then be pulled up. This this process is called it elution, like that elution there. So that is then pulled off by a system of tubes into what we call an elution vial, where you end up with a um, an aqueous solution of sodium pertechnitate, and that is the one that you actually inject into your patient. So if we have a, this is sometimes called milking. Um, so we have, if we have a look at a, a diagram which tries to explain what's going on here, here is your saline solution, um, and this is your elution vial here where the thing ends up, and this is under low pressure, and that low pressure will pull the air through the saline solution, okay, and the saline solution will come up this tube and into the alumina column where you have both the molybdate and the protechnitate adsorbed onto this alumina and it will pull off the protechnitate from this column and that will then form sodium protechnitate which will then go down this tube into your elution vial giving you a solution of sodium protechnitate. Okay, so that's called, well it's sometimes called milking but it's, it's effectively the production and, and the elution of the sodium protechnitate from from the uh, from the molybdenum and from the alumina. <clears throat> okay, so what do we do with the sodium protectinate once we've got it? Well, we need we use it as what we call a radiopharmaceutical tracer. Now, a tracer is something that can tell you where there's a problem with something, and obviously, a radiopharmaceutical well, a pharmaceutical means a drug. And a radiopharmaceutical is a drug that is radioactive. So we're using the radioactive pro properties of the drug in order to tell us where the problem is. Because we, what we can do is, is we can take that pharmaceutical and we can bond it to something else that the body system we, that we want to issue will take up quite readily. So for example, if we want to image uh, bone, and Technetium 99M is quite good for imaging bone, we can bond it to um, a chemical or a pharmaceutical that contains phosphor because phosphor is very, very readily taken up by bone because it's one of the ingredients of bone so bone uses any phosphor that's in the body and if that phosphor is then bonded to technetium 99 the technetium 99 will then enter the bone and we can get decent images about the bone okay so these are targeted pharmaceuticals targeted drugs um, that will be taken up by what we want to image. So we've been quite clever about it. Um, and that's what's known as a tracer. Okay, so here are some uh, radio pharmaceuticals that we actually use in... Oh, it's really sorry, I seem to have spelt medicine wrong up there. Just ignore that. So another one we can use for bone is fluorine 18. Uh, fluorine is also used for PET scanning, which we'll look at in a different video. Technetium 99M is quite widely used because it's got many um, different uses. So for bone, for blood circulation, and for functions of the heart and liver. And we can get very good images of functioning hearts and things like that using this process. Um, if we want to image a thyroid, we can bond it to an iodine 1, 2, 3, okay. um, sorry, no, we, we can use a, a radiopharmaceutical uh, which is an isotope of iodine and if we want to look at uh, the function of lungs we can use um, a radiopharmaceutical xenon 133. So there are various radioisotopes, radiopharmaceuticals that we can use, technetium 99M being the most common.